Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to the All Souls Community Forum coming from All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Kansas City. I'm Joe Robertson, a member of this church and also a member of the Forum Committee, a forum that for more than 75 years has sought out important conversations, promoting critical thinking on the most compelling and challenging issues of our day. Today, we have the superintendent of the Kansas City Public Schools, Dr. Mark Bedell. And uh, he's gonna give us a look at the state of the district at a propitious moment as the district is charting its future with its Blueprint 2030 project. And as the uh, Missouri Commissioner of Education, Margie Van Dieven has announced that this Tuesday at the state school board meeting, she will be recommending that the district be restored to full accreditation. So a lot is happening. And a welcome to the forum, Dr. Bedell. And so tell us about it. Yeah, we're <clears throat> excited. I, you know, I've been in this district since 2016. Uh, one of the things that the board of directors and, and what I heard from a lot of community members uh, that they charged us with was coming here and bringing us some level of consistency um, to have a truly authentic buy-in to the city. And, um, you know, what's the best way to do that? Move into the city right right about five minutes from from the board of education building enroll my three children into the system um i have two graduates out of the system now both of them now a freshman and a sophomore in college and i have a, a fifth grader still matriculating through the school district and so everything that that i took as a superintendent came from two lenses one as a parent and then one as a superintendent and what is it that our parents will want for their own children is the same expectations of what I want for my own kids. And so every decision has been made continuously to build this system in a way that by the time my daughter became a senior, God willing, and I'm still here, you know, that she would be able to graduate out of a high school, out of a high school that is in a fully accredited school district, but not just fully accredited, you know, that's, that's a baseline. So we'll celebrate and I tell everybody that, but you know, you want you want to be at or above state averages across every continuum. And that's the that's the that's the goal that I have uh, for this school district, you know, as a leader. But last Monday I did receive a phone call from the commissioner, and um, she had shared with me that they had continuously been reviewing our data. Uh, we uh, as I said earlier today, I, I really thought that. We should have gotten our accreditation in 2019. We had earned enough points over a three-year period, which is how they calculate data here, uh, that we should have gotten it in 19. Uh, didn't happen. Um, I didn't think it was going to happen anytime soon. And then I get that phone call on Monday that they were looking at our data. And I think there's a couple of studies that came out recently, one from St. Louis University. It's called the uh, Prime Center. And they just recently published a study on December 3rd of 2021. And the study was on high poverty, high growth schools. So sometimes you don't necessarily get to really witness the good work going on in high poverty schools because sometimes it don't always show up in proficient and advanced rates. But these kids show up with a lot of social and emotional distress that often becomes impediment to them being able to reach their highest achievement levels academically. Doesn't mean that they're not learning. It doesn't mean that they're not growing. And this study showed that we are growing our kids who show up in such adverse situations at a much faster rate than the state as a whole. And honestly, than urban school districts across the country. So when that was published, you know, they looked at the top 30 schools in the state of Missouri at the elementary level in math and English. And in English, our school district had eight out of the 30 schools on that list, right? I mean, that's, you know, it's just a lot of elementary schools in the state that, that fall within that poverty, high poverty index. And then we had five in math and there was no other school district remotely close to us in either one. And then we had three schools that hit both lists. And I think that had a lot to do with them saying, let's take a different look. Let's take another look at the data. And then as they looked at it, even though tests didn't occur, didn't count this year, you know, we still earned an exceeding in math uh, where everybody took a real negative hook hit because of COVID. So we're really excited about this opportunity for the city. We lost our, our, our full accreditation back in 2000. 
never regained it. I think it was always provisional or partial. And then we lost that in 2011 to then regain provisional in 2014. And so I think it's a lot to be proud of. And, um, and a lot of people have worked hard to do it. A lot of volunteers and folks like that. So it's right in time, right on time, with what we're trying to do around Blueprint 2030. Because Blueprint 2030 is it's a twofold plan. It's our five-year strategic planning process. It's also our 10-year facility um, assessment plan to ensure that we can make the decisions that we need to make uh, to ensure that we can fulfill uh, the dreams that we have for all of our students, not only with a modernized curriculum and in a, a revamped way that we look at teaching and learning, but also how we now begin to form and configure our school district around this ac academic visioning and to then be able to put our kids in, in, in buildings that have amenities that are comparable to many of the surrounding school districts. And so this is the work that we're doing with Blueprint 2030. And we definitely need your input. And it goes back to just before last Monday happened, this was um, earlier this year, the Missouri Times ran a story on uh, the work that we have been doing in the school district. Uh, the Council for Great City Schools, February 5th, 2021, said that the progress is real because they measure us against other urban school districts in the United States. And we've, we've surpassed many of those urban school districts on those key performance indicators that the Council for Great City Schools run every year. And then there's a story from the Kansas City Star where that endorsement from um, the Council for Great City Schools was further highlighted. <clears throat> so here's some of our progress towards accreditation. As you can see, um, this on the left side, KCPS rank compared to Council for Great City Schools, they take urban school districts that look just like Kansas City Public Schools and they measure us against the performance. And you can see here, when we started this work in 2016 on most of these key performance indicators that are highlighted like growth in AP coursework, growth in ninth grade, B average or better, the Kansas City Public School District generally on well over 90% of those KPIs was in the bottom fifth percentile of performance against other urban school districts across the country. And this is just an example of the progress that we've been making against urban school districts. Our graduation rates have increased by 10 percentage points over this, these past uh, five years that I've been here. And so we're up to 78%, almost 78% now. And we're thankful because of uh, some of the unique programs through partnerships with funders and, and other folks that have helped us to make that happen. We are trying to eventually move this school district to more of a non-traditional non school system. And the reason being is that our kids are graduating into a very non-traditional world. You know, we set the system up where it's still very rigid, it's very antiquated, and it does not truly adapt to the changing world that our kids are going to be exposed to upon graduation. So we have to do a better job of that. And one of the programs that we did that's truly non-traditional was this middle college program where we started a program in partnership with the Full Employment Council, uh, MCC over on the Penn Valley campus. And we said, we're gonna take kids who have dropped out of school whether you're in charter schools or whether you're in Kansas City Public School District, if you live inside of our boundaries, we're going to put you back in the school. And it's for 17 to 24 year olds. And if you're 21 and under, you still have an opportunity to get your high school diploma. If you're over 21, you have an opportunity to get your GED and then be able to persist, whether it's moving into MCC to work on your associates or get additional uh, funding from the Full Employment Council for additional training for workforce readiness. That program has made a difference. The actual graduation rate in that program is about 83%. So these are kids who have dropped out of, all, out of high schools. The regular learning environment wasn't working for them. And the way that we designed it was give them all the rights and privileges that a college student has. So they have a college ID, they have all access to the amenities over on the MCC campus, 
and they have the access to build a very flexible schedule that works for them. And that is ultimately where I want to go with Blueprint 2030. How do we make sure that we can begin to look at non-traditional schooling options for our kids in high school by the time they hit the 11th grade? Do we form schools to go from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the high school level? And kids, when they become a junior, are able to go into school on blocks. And then they can do some of their courses online because that works better for them, but allows for them now to have access to internships and those kind of things. <clears throat> and then the last thing I'll say, Kelly, before we move to the next slide, we started a um, KCPS International Welcome Center. And this is because we have the largest English language learning population in the state of Missouri. So we get a boatload of students who come in from all around the world into our school district. We, as we looked at our data, our data told us that we're not moving that student subpopulation at a fast rate. So we figured we needed to do something. So we started this International Welcome Center. We did our ribbon cutting back in September and it's already beginning to pay dividends early on. And so we want our school district to be very responsive to meeting the needs of our community and the students uh, that we serve. And we think we can do a lot more of this in a non-traditional manner. Next slide. So the ultimate goal of Blueprint 2030 is to increase academic achievement and enhance the student experience. We simply believe that we cannot sustain, I'm trying to get out of this sun real quick. We cannot sustain the progress that we've made if we do not begin to look at changing how we deliver teaching and learning and what experiences do we provide to our students. And so it is also our vision um, with these goals that it will serve to update our strategic plan, which is in its last year of implementation. And then our goal is to make sure that we're continuously monitoring and updating this plan after the first five years to, to ensure that we are on track to achieve the vision. So here's where we are. Uh, we've already gone through phase one assessment. Um, we've gone through, we're, we're actually at this point concluding our goal setting. And we're going to get into scenario planning because I think that's where the bulk of the community really, really wants to weigh in is on the scenario planning. The scenario planning is also going to have us to present to the community what the system will be configured as. How many high schools do we have? How many middle schools do we need? How many elementary schools do we need? What kind of programs are we going to have? And how do we make sure that we're serving the community in a very equitable manner? not leaving holes within the system that we want people to be able to say, hey, we have a neighborhood school that we feel our kids can attend. And we are very proud of what programs are being offered in those particular programs. But all of this is contingent on us on the 26th of June of January, bringing to the board our academic plan, our academic vision. And then from there, we will begin to engage the community around a scenario planning after we then share with them, here's what we want to do academically in the future. And we're just excited about the opportunities that we have here. So then we'll get to the scenario component and then there will be recommendations. And on those recommendations, we'll bring that those recommendations to the board. Our hope is by the end of May, we can bring these recommendations to the board for them to take action on, and then we will begin implementation. There are some things that we can do right now in the immediate uh, with implementation that will impact the upcoming school year. And then there are other things that have to be phased in. There are some things that we won't be able to start until the following year, two years, three years out. And then ultimately, if the community agrees to support us with a bond, because we haven't passed the bond uh, referendum since 1967. So our buildings are aging and the infrastructure in them is just absolutely horrible. Then we know that in order for you to begin to see anything from that, that's a five year uh, deal before you begin to even see the fruits of that labor. And then we will continuously um, evaluate this over the, over the uh, life of, of Blueprint 2030. <clears throat> so we've engaged a lot of people. And as you can see on this slide, 
Um, our goal is to make sure that we don't leave any stone unturned. I don't want somebody to say, we didn't know that this was coming. What we do want is for everybody to say, man, the district went out of their way and they truly engaged us and they came to us not knowing what they wanna do. See, here's what I'll tell everybody on this call. As a professional, I do know what we need to do. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I don't have community buy-in. My job is to listen to the community and you all have to tell me how far do you all want us to go with this. But I do as a professional know what we should do, doesn't necessarily always align with what the community wants. That was the case for our strategic plan. I came here with a bunch of things that I wanted in that strategic plan. I got a lot of it in there, but there were some things the community just said, that's not going to work for our community. So we're gonna treat this process the same way we did when we went through the engagement process for building our first strategic plan that we've stood with. And that's a big reason too why we are being considered for full accreditation because of how tightly aligned and adhered we were to that strategic plan. But you all are just another part of this engagement uh, piece and we'll be able to log all of this information in and, and be able to have that accountability back to our board and the community that we are reaching out and, and touching everybody in this city. Next slide. <clears throat> our students have already spoken. We did a workshop with them, um, a bunch of secondary students, and, and they went through all of our different goal statements that we're proposing. Our students told us from the experience size, side of things, they want more extracurricular activities. They put things down that we don't offer right now. We don't offer archery. We don't offer badminton, hockey. Those could be some things that may be done in an intramural type scenario, because we also know that some of those things are not offered here in the Kansas City region at all. So our kids wouldn't necessarily have any type of Misha related um, competition. Culturally relevant teaching. We have a very diverse school district. Our kids wanna see themselves represented in a positive way in the literature. And we have an opportunity to do that as we think about a culturally responsive curriculum that embraces everybody in our system. More student field trips. Um, a lot of them talk about that, having therapeutic connections or counseling. A lot of our kids are struggling with social and emotional distress. So we know that we have to figure out how to build that into our system that it is readily available for our kids at all of our schools. Next slide. Some of the additional things that they talked about is that uh, we need more classes that would be valuable in life, like law, additional languages. We've talked about as a part of Blueprint 2030, wanting to have language acquisition at our elementary schools beginning in the second grade or beginning in kindergarten, I mean. So that's a big part of this. How do we fund all of this? Something has to go in order for us to do some of these things that our kids are telling us they want. And quite frankly, people in the community, a lot of grads, um, a lot of the thing goals we're focusing on are great. I think we need more family engagement. So people want to figure out how do we get our families connected? So what we said we would do is try to, in those four commitments, really create an infrastructure for family engagement that is almost, it's hidden, it's embedded in there and people don't even know it's in there, but it brings authentic family engagement out. And then the last one I'll say is, it seems like all these goals are focused around support. And I like that. Our kids are just saying that they need more support. They need those mentoring. They need the counseling sessions. They need the um, extracurricular connections. They need the tutoring. So we're excited about where our students see this going and, and they seem to be excited. So here's our proposed new mission statement. If any of you have done any work with our school district or followed our school district, if you look at our current mission statement, it is probably, I don't know, two paragraphs, it's too much. You know, we want something that people can easily read and understand where we're going. And what we say in our school district, and this is what we're proposing to the community, upholding the promise of an equitable educational experience so Kansas City students thrive socially, emotionally, and academically. 
And we think it's simple, it's easy to catch on to. And if anybody's question on it, it's really not a hard mission statement to remember. So that's, the, that's kind of where we are with that. Our, our four commitments is, is, is simple. Commitment number one, learning. We have to focus on student achievement and effective teaching, first and foremost. That is critical, that we make sure that we provide a personalized, rigorous, culturally responsive instructional system. People will hear about that on the 26th of January uh, when we roll out our whole academic plan to the board. Support, how do we make sure, as the students said, we support them? So whole child and community partnerships, we definitely wanna focus on the student experience. We wanna make sure that our students are challenged, that they're supported, and that we're giving them multiple opportunities to thrive. And then people, making sure that we have a talented workforce and that we have highly effective teachers and leaders in our school district who truly understand how to form real relationships with our students. And then the system as a whole, how do we manage the whole system? We want this to be a sustainable and accredited school district. We do not wanna be where, we're, where we have a lot of volatility and we do not want one year we're there, the next year we're out, the next year we're there. We want this to be sustainable. So let's share, share with you what this looks like. And we're gonna leave probably about 20 to 25 minutes, I wanna say for any questions that you all may have around the direction we're going in and, 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 and any input that you can offer us to make sure that we're doing this right. Next slide. So when we talk about student learning, this is our focus, everybody, right? We're gonna look at building out STEAM schools in our elementary schools. We're gonna focus on culturally responsive teaching and learning. We're gonna become a project-based learning school district where we really then tie that into interdisciplinary learning and our kids are able to take what we're trying to teach them from a standard standpoint and make it real, helping them to solve real world problems, real community problems. So we think this approach will make school much more engaging for our students. And we did hear that from our students that we did the workshop with. They really like the ideal of project-based learning, um, district-wide literacy focus and numeracy focus, uh, personalized intervention plans for every student below grade level. And then we wanna make sure that we're looking at flexible learning models because if COVID taught us one thing, it taught us that we just simply were not flexible enough to pivot. We wanna be able to do that as a part of Blueprint 2030. Next slide. As we think about the support, we talked about it earlier, we want to attain trauma-informed school status for all of our KCPS schools. Um, we think that that would significantly improve us uh, being able to reach their academic potential because we're addressing those social and emotional impediments. We wanna make sure that we're offering world language and fine arts. And we want robust fine arts programs starting at the elementary level so we can begin to feed our kids into middle school with some level of some understanding of where their gifts lie within the fine arts arena. Um, and then world language. Every kid, to, in my opinion, should be able to have access to a second language and be able to graduate you know, proficient in another language because that's the way that this world is evolving. We have an evening school. So we wanna continue. This is new this year. It's from, um, I think 12 to eight or five to eight. We don't have many kids in it, but we have some kids. They have to work during the day. So they're coming in at night and they're taking advantage of our evening acad academy. And these kids are gonna get their high school diploma because they're only a few credits shy. They just need to work to help make ends meet. So we wanna make sure that we're doing an expansion of these non-traditional schools. And then of course, the expanded extracurricular activities, band, the robust sports offering. We think that this is, this is, this is very critical. Next slide. People, I've said this before, we're gonna build, um, continue to build on our Grow Your Own. If you all haven't heard, there is a deficit with teachers across the country, but it's really bad here in the state of Missouri. And we know it's bad here in the state of Missouri. Number one, Missouri is in the bottom end of teacher salary in the United States. And we know that people can easily go to a bordering state and take advantage of, 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 of a healthier salary. 
So we know that in our school district, we got to figure out other ways to try to incentivize our teachers and the law don't allow us to do those things. We can work with philanthropy and some funders and folks like that to possibly help us, but that's, that's just simply not sustainable. It's going to require that we have to push our state to show a different degree of value towards our educators. And we think that that could begin to slow this bleed of teachers that we have. We want to make sure that we have a robust leadership development center. And then over here on the far right, that's our calendar, right? We're going we're gonna to engage everybody in this calendar. I want to blow the calendar up. You know, right now our calendar says we have to start school the fourth, no, no earlier than the fourth Monday, and that's by law, of the school year. And then we generally are out by Memorial Day. Well, the biggest issue that we tend to have is that the gap that kids have during the summer inserts a significant amount of learning loss and learning regression. So my attitude is, why can't I build out a, a, a calendar that is almost year round? And it would be like a trimester type calendar. We go to school from August until November. And then all of the kids who need supports during the month of November come in, but everybody can be off during the month of November. Um, but the kids who need support come in, we pay our teachers to work with them. Those first three weeks in November, everybody's off during that Thanksgiving week. We start our second trimester. You take that through March. And then you have an intercession number two in March. Everybody can either, you know, our teachers that need to not work, can not work. Our kids who are doing well can vacation or they can come in for enrichment. The kids who need support the first three weeks in March, those kids will be with us. We'll pay our teachers summer school rates. And then everybody's off during spring break. So everybody's getting these mental breaks throughout the year. And it's reducing the amount of time that we are away from our kids. But it also gives us more time with our kids. It gives us more time. So that requires us to have to remove some barriers at the state level. But it also requires that we have an appetite here locally to want to do something like this that we think could significantly benefit not only our kids, but it would help us with recruitment of teachers. I promise you, it would help us. So these are the things that we're gonna be working on as a part of this plan as we engage the community. Next one. Um, and it's system sustainable and accredited. We just talked about it. It's sustainable if we increase pre-K, we define these future facility needs and get our kids in modernized buildings make sure that we align grade configurations and system of predictability, a lot easier for people to go through, make sure that we address all of our inefficiencies. I can't come and ask anybody for a 10 year GO bond if I don't address the inefficiencies in our system. Blueprint 2030 will require us to address that both inside of central office and inside of our schools. Next slide. So, this is where you can find more information. And Kelly, I know as we wrap this up, because we did want to give people time to ask questions. Kelly, do you want to come in and just kind of talk about this component here around the engagement, the information piece? Sure, sure. Good morning, everyone. So this is our website that's serving as really a repository for all of our blueprint information. You can find all of our engagement dates on here. You can find attachments. Um, as far back as market research to system analysis to, um, you know, just history of KCPS in general. So this website's a really good resource for those in the community who want to continue to learn more and continue to join us for future engagement events. So this is the address. We encourage you to join um, that web page and, um, and, and follow us here. All right. We'll keep it moving. Um, oh, we just have a highlight here. We're currently in phase two, just to remind everyone that we're in phase two of the process on that goal setting and then moving into scenario planning as we get into the spring. And then there's more here, um, advisory team. We do have an advisory team and Dr. Bedell noted that during the engagement uh, slide that he had. We have about 120 folks who consistently join us every month to learn about the process and the progress of Blueprint 2030. So those advisory team meetings are here on the website as well if you wanna go look at presentations uh, for the progress that we're making in the system. And, I, and I'll say this, um, and I know we can go back to the screen where we can see everybody face. 
But I'll say this to everybody, a big reason why this Blueprint 2030 came about was because we had conducted what was called the Ann Landscape Study, where we took a look at um, not only our, the data that we had on KCPS, but we took a look at the data on the charters. And one of the things we learned was that there were significant inefficiencies when you compared the number of students we have inside of the Kansas City boundaries to Springfield, very similar. And we figured we needed to do something. So one of the things we also did was we said, how do we, because when I interviewed in 2016, the one question that came up was, well, Dr. Bedell, what's your position on charters? And I remember saying to people, um, I don't oppose charters. Uh, I grew up in, in Houston, Texas as an educator. And all I know is charters. What I do oppose is the Kansas City Public School District not having a level playing field to compete with charters because of the way that legislation is written in this state. Um, but I did take it upon myself to say, how do we, how do KCPS cross that line in the sand and work with charters? So we've been able to address some of these inefficiencies. There are some charters now where we do shared transportation. There are some charters where we do shared food services. There are some charters that also are having kids attend manual tech through an MOU. And uh, ultimately for me, everybody, what I care about, I care about this district deeply. I am a public ed guy first and will always be that. But what I care about most is children. And I want children to succeed regardless of where they go. I think we as adults have a responsibility to try to work together and accept the conditions for what it is, but to do the right thing by children. And I think when you operate in that manner, right, blessings will come your way. They will come your way. And so we've taken this system analysis data, the ed landscape data that has begun to shape what we're doing with Blueprint 2030. But I don't want anybody to leave this call thinking that um, we're not competitive because we are very competitive. I want all of the kids in my school district. That's the part of a uh, portion of what we're doing with Blueprint 2030. If we do this right, can we attract them back to become members of the Kansas City Public School District rather than being in competitor sites? So, um, Joe, we at this point definitely wanted to leave some time to have some dialogue to, to, to whatever questions, whatever thoughts are on people's mind. Yeah, okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bedell with the Kansas City Public Schools uh, Superintendent uh, here on the All Souls Forum. And, and it looks like first up is uh, Richard Thompson. Congratulations on your uh, hopefully upcoming accreditation. Uh, <clears throat> do you, uh, are you continuing to work with nonprofits like the Kansas City Teacher Residency to uh, get talented teachers in the classroom? Yeah, we have a strong relationship with them and they every single year have helped to supply educators for us. It's probably one of the teacher prep programs or development programs or conversion, because I think they also take people who aren't certified teachers and turn them into certified teachers. It's probably one that I would say is, is probably the best partnership I have right now um, through that program. I love, love what they're doing over there. Okay, and they got Chuck and or Karen. Hi, Dr. Bedell. Um, I'm a former teacher. I've been retired since COVID started because um, I have diabetes and there's no way I'm going to. I will, you know, I was wondering, are people leaving teaching because of the way they're treated by parents? Because I found that in, in a district I worked in, in St. Louis, before we moved here. Um, I would love to sub, you know, because I know subs, you need subs too, but um, I can't do it until this all calms down. But do you think teachers are under too much pressure? I do. I think it's, I, I think it's probably a three or four pronged reason. Mm -hmm. One, perhaps, is the relationship with parents. Um, I think that there's the teacher, teacher pay concern. It's something that I've been advocating for since I got here. It's been a part of our legislative agenda uh, to push in Jefferson City, more competitive pay for teachers. And I know teachers don't do it for the money, but you know, a lot of educators incur a lot of debt going through college and then to live a, life, a lifelong um, 
professional career in debt because of how long it takes for them to get to a respectable amount of uh, earning. And uh, the, the unfortunate part about it is, you know, if you want to make money in education and you in that sense sometimes have to leave the classroom and go on to be an administrator. I mean, that's kind of what happened to me. You know, I ended up having two kids back to back and I was like, man, this teacher salary is not going to be able to help me take care of my family. And I had to, I wanted to be a teacher, a career teacher. Um, but I, so that's something that I'm real big on trying to advocate uh, here in the Jeff, at the Jefferson City. But I also think there's another factor. It's especially for teachers who work in districts like this one, where they are also, how do I say this word? They're hit with so much second degree trauma from what our kids show up with. Like there's some things that you got, you all don't understand and maybe you do. I've never, I've been, been in education since 1999. I've never had the amount of student murders in any of these districts I've worked in. Last year, I had 12 kids murdered. Every year, I'm averaging 10 to 12 kids murdered. That comes back to these teachers. In addition to all of the other things that these kids are dealing with, we got one of the highest homeless rates in the state, homeless population. As I've said to you, we got the highest ELL population. We have a high special ed population, right? Uh, we have the highest eviction rate, zip code in the state of Missouri, here in the central feeder pattern. Nobody knows all of this stuff. And so what happens is you have volatility that these kids are going through and then the volatility that these teachers experience and then it accelerates teacher burnout. And then you couple that with the significant amount of testing, which I've taken a lot of that away over this year because I'm like, man, I if, if, if we, focus all, all, only on testing, right? Then the teachers don't ever get to respond to the little bit of data that they have. And, if, and so we said, no, we're just gonna do iReady, focus on iReady, respond to it, and let's help our kids. But all this other stuff we're taking off your plate. And I think that has created a situation in our school district where I got 27 vacancies right now. Maybe it's down to 24, I think we hired three more, all right? But there's districts in the state of Missouri right now that's sitting with 120 teacher vacancies. I got a friend in Virginia who has 130 vacancies right now. So we're fortunate where we are, um, given that we only have 27. That was the last check. But there are so many reasons why teachers are choosing to go elsewhere. And, um, and it's mainly because they just don't feel valued or appreciated. Dr. Bill, I, I th a quick question for you. I know you have talked about the efficiencies that are needed to be able to do to provide the experiences that uh, that you want, all, particularly at high schools and things and band like that. So, and and the the hardest part of that may be school closings. I know you the. And so how do you frame that? Because I know that you know that that's. I mean, I you didn't mention school closings. I'm going to go and mention it for you, but because yeah. I know how do you want to how do you want to frame that? No, no. I, I mean, I think it's it's a necessity. We have to do it. I mean, that's, that, that was the reason why we put the data out on looking at us against uh, uh, a uh, Springfield or us against an independence. Independence, they, they have around the same amount of children we have, but they have what, three or four high school options? We got seven. It's just not possible to continue to be able to run a high school with under, four, with under 400 kids and think you're gonna be able to give them the access to all of these elective courses that these kids want, the foreign languages. You can't even fill healthy bands or music or theater programs when you have that few of kids in a school. So yeah, the reality is, is that when we come out with the scenarios, right, we're gonna come out and say, here's scenario one. If we do everything in scenario one, it's gonna allow us to do everything we wanna do. Are you all as a community willing to, to work with scenario one? We'll come out with a scenario two. Scenario two will say, if we do 70% of these things, here's what we'll have to stay and here's what would have to go. And then we'll do a scenario three, right? Which is the bare minimum that if you don't really do anything, guess what, everybody? We're going to be right back here again in five years. And then we can do a scenario four, which is 
how do we take the best of each of those scenarios and come together as a community and say, this is the one that's gonna make the most sense for us. So we wanna, we really do want to engage everybody in that process, but the reality is, yeah, we, we can't continue to operate the number of schools that we currently have, but we have to shape it all around the academic visioning for the future, if that makes sense. Sure, uh, Carol's got a question. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, this may be a uh, minutia from the, uh, for you because you're at the highest level of decision making for the district, uh, more or less. <laughs> um, but I recently read the book Push Out and I'm pretty sheltered and privileged. So there were a lot of revelations in there that I didn't think of. But the main focus being on girls and the pipeline to crime as opposed to boys in the schools creating a pipeline to crime through juvenile hall and so on. Um, has that been a part of trainings or anything? Um, and it sort of puts a lot of load on teachers, which of course, a little while ago, we were just saying, uh, wow, they're, they're hearing these traumas that the kids are getting and they got an awful load. So yeah, that's my question. Yeah, I think what we've done, um, we do a lot of implicit bias training and it's built inside of our system through Dr. Daryl Davis, who's been in the district for 26 years. And a lot of that, those type of discussions are, are, are discussed um, in those meetings. And in particular, with anybody that's new that's come into the district over the last five years or four, last four years or so, they, they, it's a mandatory training. We have to kind of circle back during our summer institute. Hold on, everybody. I'm struggling here with this. Um, with, the, um, with the summer institute uh, to um, make sure that we're working with our current teachers who have been here with a lot of experience to give them that training. There's another thing that we also do is, um, you know, we do a lot of mentoring in this school district. So we have gone after a, a, a lot of folks that, that want to help our kids and kind of help them cope through some of that stuff. And also just be able to offload when they're going through some scenarios that may be taking them down a negative path. I know my wife who's upstairs works for Jackson County Casa as an attorney, but she has mentored a kid every year, a female student every year at Central Middle. And then we've also formed a new mentoring branch for just female students only. The pandemic has kind of slowed us up in being able to be able to do it in person, but we have formed um, uh, something very similar to what we have for our boys, uh, a, a, a mentoring branch just for females. Thank you. Yes. Hey, Richard, you're up. Uh, yeah, I, you made a comment earlier that raised a uh, question in my mind. Um, what, uh, if anything, can be done to address the issue of transient students? For You probably know what that is, but for people that don't on this call, that's, you know, basically homeless students or students that don't have secure housing? This is a tough one um, because the way that you address it is really based on the topic that I think you all are going to talk about next week with those Kansas City Star reporters. Um, if you don't have affordable housing and affordable housing is becoming harder and harder here inside of Kansas City. There was a article that came out back in April which had Kansas City, Missouri, number one in the United States in rental rates increases. Our rental rate increased 33% year over year. And all you see inside of this city right now is a bunch of high rise apartments being developed. So what's happening now is as it's being gentrified, because now the gentrification has moved past Paseo, you know, I'm seeing it because our office is on 29th and Troops. So it's past Paseo. It's starting to hit some parts of Prospect. And families can't afford what is now happening with income tax, property tax increases that are happening as a result of all of this new development. So then when things are appraised, all of that goes up. All, it, all it's doing now is it's contributing more to the homeless rates. And... And I don't know, 
the only thing I can tell you to answer that question is we have to focus on making sure that we have some affordable housing in the urban core. And that's that's steady going away. And so I, I, I had a conversation with Congressman Cleaver um, just around the whole infrastructure bill piece. I talked about some of our buildings that we have that are black, that are mothballed right now. Can we utilize some of these mothball buildings to turn them into homeless shelters for homeless kids? So I'm in conversation with him right now. A former superintendent in Jennings did something like that where she turned one of her schools into a homeless shelter and then provided all of the wraparound services and supports in there and got some community entities to help support it. And it was a hit. She's now the superintendent in Topeka. And the beautiful thing is she was a former employee of the Kansas City Public School District. So I'm looking at some of those kind of things at this point too, uh, Richard. Okay, and uh, Dr. Bell, we have a question that, that I know Kelly's addressed in the, in the chat, but it's a good question. I think that you might be interested also that, that you know, it's from Cassie uh, and it's that she says that my family and I are new this year to Kansas City Public Schools. Their sons attend Longfellow and they would love to become more involved with the school, but it's taken a lot of effort to figure out how to do that. Are there plans to help you know, forge or pave a parent school connection? So tell us what are the same things that about you know, parent and then also community to school connections. Okay, Kelly, I'll let you answer that one because you know that's one that I'm I'm kind of really pushing in Kelly's department because that's part of her department. Yes, thank you. And Cassie, I apologize. I said Carrie in the chat, but Cassie, thank you. I'm glad your sons attend Longfellow. It's a wonderful little school right there in the heart of that community in Kansas City. So yes, we have um, SACS, uh, school advisory committees or councils at every single school, and those are up and running more, um, you know, flourishing at more school at some schools versus other schools. So Longfellow is one that has really great parent involvement, it's a longstanding school in the community. But if you can email me, I want to get you connected to our district advisory council. This is a committee that meets four times a year, and we talk about engagement. We talk about uh, parent advocacy. We talk about student advocacy, and we have to continue to get better at having engaged parents who want to work for the district, advocate for the district, testify on behalf of the district, and just know what's going on in their kids' um, schooling and their kids' lives and in our schools uh, directly. So. We have lots of avenues to get you onboarded. Uh, please email me and we'll have you get connected pretty quickly. We also have things like parent universities that have been online this year. We have our blueprint engagement process that we're talking about today. We have school events. COVID has been very hard uh, in planning events directly in person, but would love to get you involved. And uh, we do have several routes to do so. But we do need you to help encourage your peers, uh, your fellow parents to also join and get involved in those opportunities so that we continue to build our pipeline of parents who are engaged and advocates for our kids. Thank you. All right, and, and Dr. Bell, I would, throw, I would throw another question here. This is, um, has, has the district in, engaged in any kind of polling or surveying as far as like the appetite for a bond issue or a levy increase? Uh, you know, other school districts, they, they, they've been slam bang, uh, easy, easy, uh, things to get in other school districts. Is Kansas City ready and how do you know? So we we haven't, um, I, I, I'll find out. I think I have to, I had some conversation with the Civic Council in the chamber and I know both of those entities were definitely in support of it. But in terms of, of, of straw polling or anything like that, we haven't, and the only reason being is because I wanted to make sure that we were able to execute Blueprint 2030 first. It's hard for me to come for and ask when people will say, well, but you got all of these buildings and you only got, you got small numbers of kids in some of the buildings. What are you guys going to do about that first? And so I wanted to try to get Blueprint 2030 address, give this community a sense of, of um, a sustainable future ahead for us. So the, the accreditation news will be huge on Tuesday. I think it makes all of this a little bit more possible than it was before I got that call last Monday. But then when we get through Blueprint 2030 and having engaged the community and them having an understanding of how we see this school district fitting into the future of this city as a whole, 
I think that makes it a little bit easier for us to begin to really then focus our efforts on um, trying to get a bond pass and, and, and see where the community appetite is. Um, I would add to that, Joe, to, to piggyback on Dr. Bedell there. One of the things that we would certainly do to his point is after Blueprint 2030 kind of gets implemented, voted on by the board, as we get into the summer and fall and think about when it is, when would be the best time to have that bond issue go to the public, we would certainly wanna do some polling um, in that summer, fall time before the spring so that we know where our community is and have a good indication of how folks would feel about us even putting a bond on the ballot. So there's a big process that, you know, after working in several districts that we would uh, go through to see where our community is before we even put it on the ballot. And I would add that I guess Dr. Bedell, you know, you, I believe you were the 27th superintendent in 45 years, and I know that one of the things that was mentioned as far as this accreditation situation coming up Tuesday was the stability, because um, I think uh, your predecessors for 50 years did, either didn't survive or otherwise didn't stay long enough to see uh, plans like this through. I mean, so uh, I guess the question is, are you in? Yeah, I mean, I'm in. I, I, you know, people. I've, I was told when I got the job. I remember this one guy told me, "They'll run you out of here in two years," and I, and I was. It was my first day on the job. I went over to 18th and Vine because it was that first Friday, and this guy came up to me and said, "So you the new superintendent? Welcome. You know, I want you to know, man. You, you, you'll be here like the rest of them, only two years." I said, "All right." I said, "Well, we'll see." Well, you know, and I remember coming back to him after I signed that first extension and said, hey, you know, you the, you know, you the dude that said, told everybody, you telling folks I wasn't gonna be around. Uh, my, my history of working in school districts speaks for itself. Everywhere I've worked, I've had no less than four years of tenure, no less than four. I don't move around a lot. And so, you know, I'm, I'm here, there's a lot of work that I have to see through and the truth is, if and I'm not trying to sound like I'm boastful or anything like that, but the reality is, if it was about the money, y'all, I would have been gone. I've had 19 opportunities to leave. There's Miami Dade getting emails about that right now, getting emails about Philly right now. It ain't about the money. It's about seeing something all the way through. And that's what I'm trying to do. All right, Richard. <clears throat> Thank you for handling my multitude of questions. Um, <laughs> I'm good with uh, you. Keep asking. Is uh, part of Blueprint 2030 going to be uh, reducing class size? Is that something you have budget for? So honestly, it's part of our talk. I'm not certain that that's the priority at this point. Um, I think it just depends on how far we go with the recommendations, you know, with the scenarios. That will determine... Because I think for me, I also need to be able to hire reading and math interventionists. And we have to also think about this, everybody. If there is a teacher deficit, a teacher shortage, small class sizes is going to make that harder to be fully staffed. And Dr. Bell, let's... Tell me about, you said it was Monday when you got the call from the uh, commissioner. Uh, now, did, were you were you anticipating that at all? Or tell me, what was your what was your, your reaction? No. Nope. Hey, Kelly, take care. I'll see you on uh, Monday at work. Um, so I have received a phone call, I want to say on December 23rd, maybe, from her research person. Just saying, hey, uh, just wanted to talk to you to let you know we've been looking at your data. Um, there is a possibility that it might go on the board agenda January or February. But I kind of took it with a grain of salt because we've been through this. We've been through this before. I thought it was going to be on the agenda last December of, of, 20, of 2020, 2020. And it, it never got on the agenda. And then it never got on the agenda at all over the next three months as we've been work as we were working with Desi. So I really just was like, all right, whatever. And then I get the call on Monday, and and she was like, you know, are you sitting down? And I was like, yes, ma'am. And she was like, we 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 placed your uh, we're recommending you for accreditation 
on next Tuesday. I said, what? And then she said, yeah, you guys, even though like MPIs are dropping across the state, you guys continue to outgrow your outpace in the state. You're still earning exceeding um, expectations on these different indicators that we look at. Your graduation rates have gone up more. You've doubled your IB performance. Like our international baccalaureate, we only have 47% of our kids scoring a qualifying score. Now, these are your Lincoln kids, right? That number now is probably around 82%. So not only that, we have more kids taking it. Advanced placement, we only had about 4% of our kids passing that exam four years ago. That number's up to 24%. So we're moving the needle, but it's not just that. We, we have hundreds of kids taking the courses now and taking the exam. So normally when you have more kids take it, those scores tend to drop, but they're going up. So we're doing something right. And so I said, well, what do we have to do? And she said, just show up. You can, you can make some remarks, but we've already put together a, an 11 page slide deck that we're going to present. So Desi's gonna present their case to the state board why we should be fully accredited. They've done all of the work. We just have to go and show up and I'll talk a little bit about Blueprint 2030 and what we plan to do to sustain it. And how's the, how would you say the 2030 project is gone? So is, have you gotten, has your uh, approach or any, any ideas that you had uh, been changing as you go through this process? Not yet. I think the biggest thing, Joe, that I wish I could have done over again is to try to not give people the appearance that this is about facilities, but everybody's going to make it about facilities because that's what sells newspapers. Um, when we met with when we met with the media, we told them that this was about redesigning our education system as it's currently designed and, and, and really deconstructing it and rebuilding it to be more responsive to the city that we serve. And that's not how it came out. So I didn't want everybody to feel like, man, this is all this is about is school closures. No, this is about blowing up a calendar. This is about going non-traditional. This is about changing the way that we conduct teaching and learning in our school, moving away from a traditional model of teaching to a project-based learning model, to an inquiry-based learning model, to a mastery-based model over time. This is about taking the high school day and changing it and not having kids boxed in from 720 to 220. Why can't they come to school eight to eight, as I said earlier? And by the time they're in 11th grade, maybe they're coming in in windows, eight to 12, one to four, four to eight. And now they can work and they can do those things. But now they can also do their internships during the school day because some of them can't do it because they have to take care of siblings or they have to work. How, so my this Blueprint 2030 is, this is about the future of what education can look like around this country. <clears throat> All right, well, we've been listening to Dr. Bedell, Mark Bedell, the superintendent of the Kansas City Public Schools. Uh, and, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bedell. This has been fascinating. And um, I'll thank you all. And I'll also take a quick moment here to tell you about next Sunday's forum, Kansas City Star reporters Eric Adler, Mike Hendricks, and Kevin Hardy are going to talk about the Star's investigation into damaging real estate speculation that's titled uh, Kansas City's East Side Land Grab.